Well, it's good to be here on tonight and to see so many connected to and, and feeling the call to stand for justice and for freedom and for righteousness everywhere. I'm grateful tonight to be here. I'm, you know, from North Carolina, uh, where many of our members of the human family are still under floodwaters of Hurricane Florence, but poor and low wealth people who were in a storm before the storm. Before the storm, North Carolina had 4.7 million people in poverty and low wealth. Before the storm, a million people were uninsured, and our legislature refused to expand Medicaid, which could have covered 500,000 of them before the storm. You'd have to work at North Carolina's minimum wage 87 hours a week just to be able to afford a basic two-room bedroom before the storm. So there was a storm before the storm that didn't have to be. And then there was, and now after the storm, there are people without insurance, without homes, politicians that will accept federal money for infrastructure but will not accept federal money for individual health insurance for those who need it. 51 hog lagoons have spilled over in the waters. Coal ash ponds are running over. And I just left the other day when we challenged the legislature to fix these things in a special session because there's some storms that don't have to be. We can fix them. We don't have to warm up our climate like we're doing it. We can fix that. And they said when we raised these questions concerning the least of these, that we were politicizing the storm. Um, and so that's where I'm coming from and headed back to. I'm also president of Repairers of the Breach. Uh, that is one of the co-sponsors of the Poor People's Campaign. I know Reverend Erica Williams is here, uh, one of our great national um, organizers. I'm, Bring your greetings as I serve as visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary. And I bring you greetings from the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. Um, which over the last three years has, has built down in order to build up. You know, from the country we learned that great trees stand by their roots, not by their limbs not by their leaves. So we've been building deep. 41 coordinating committees now in 41 states in the District of Columbia to lift up the concerns of the poor and the rejected. We launched this campaign on Mother's Day, ended the launch on the summer solstice, in other words, birthing light. 40 days of action, more than 5,000 people engaged in simultaneous civil disobedience in 41, 40 states in the District of Columbia, more simultaneous civil disobedience than any time in the history of the 20th or 21st century. More than 38 million Twitter, Twitter, whatever they call Twitter impressions. <laughs> Over 4 million people watched our videos. Thousands of people who've now signed up. We created something called the Souls of Poor Folk Auditing America. 50 years after the uh, original Poor People's Campaign. You should get that audit <coughs> by IPS and the Poor People's Campaign. It's, go online and get it, The Souls of Poor Folk. You should go online and look up the Poor People's Campaign. It's not an organization, it's an organism, a movement of poor people and moral leaders, faith leaders and advocates. People have joined together and saying that you can never address really the issues and the problems of America unless you address five issues simultaneously, systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, militarism, and the war economy, and the nation's distorted moral narrative that grows out of religious nationalism and Christian nationalism.
25,000 people showed up on June 23rd to say that they would be the founding members of a new Poor People's Campaign, a national call for a moral revival. We're currently doing registering people for the movement who will vote, not just for, who will vote, but for the movement who vote with an analysis, vote with, a, with an agenda. And we're doing hearings across the country. And we are black, we're white, we're brown, we're yellow, we're red. We're Christian, we're Jewish, we're Palestinian, we're Muslim, we're Hindu, we're Sikh, we're people of faith and not of faith. We're rich, people with a conscience, poor people with, with deep heart and, and, and concern. We are rural, we are urban, we are old, we are young, we are abled body, we are disab dis disabled bodies, but we still have fight in us. We are God's children, we are America, and we are determined that we will not allow the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country to be ignored anymore. <laughs> and, and we've only, only just begun. I bring you greetings from the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, mostly where I have been a pastor now for some 25 years and served also as a former moderator of the church. And also I bring you greetings from the College of Affirming Bishops where we are united across, you can turn it up some, across denominations and faith streams to affirm the dignity of all people regardless of race, sex, gender, nationality, religion, or sexual orientation. Somebody asked me about the College of Affirming Bishops, Mark, because a lot of people talk about, you know, being open to the LGBTQ community. But I felt as a straight man, one of the things I had to do, they got in the office to serve in di different colleges of bishops. But I said, you know, it's one thing for straight people to affirm the LGBT community, Q community. What, if, what about the LGBTQ community laying hands on us? And so I decided to be affirmed where the bishop is the same gender loving woman, Bishop Yvette Flunder, and allow her to lay hands on me, to consecrate me as a straight man into a college of bishops. It's time to get real about loving each other. Now, I come to you today with the support of all of these institutions and networks and with the great love of my friend, Phyllis Bennis. Where's Phyllis? Phyllis, who is a great sister beloved and one of the many people that I talk to often. But I also come to you as a person with particular experiences. I am, as you can see, a black man. But there's more to my story. When I was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, where my father, in the days when in the American South, despite a ruling in the Supreme Court in 1954, the notion of states' rights ruled the South. And in that time, my father had relocated for graduate studies to Indianapolis, Indiana, and when I was born on August 30th, two days after the March on Washington, they say, my mother says she went into labor on August 28th, 1963, and I said, wait a minute, there's a march going on, <laughs> and let's see how that turns out first. <laughs> but when I was born, my father literally insisted that my birth certificate not simply identify me as Negro. He battled, not in the South, in the Midwest. Because my father knew that that wasn't the whole truth about who I am. I have cousins in Eastern North Carolina with skin as white and eyes as blue or green as any Midwesterner you'll meet here on the streets of Minnesota. The blood of the Tuscaroan Indians, the Tuscaroan First Nation people, the original habit inhabitants of my native North Carolina run in my veins. Yes, I am black, or as Ozzie Davis said, Afro-American, quoting Malcolm, but I'm also white. I'm also native. 
And I cannot, in honesty, talk about the rights of any people without talking about who I am. In North Carolina, they say my Tuscarora ancestors greeted the British settlers who were remembered now as the lost colony. They lost contact with their British sponsors and didn't set up the colonial outpost they were supposed to. The Tuscaroans also had their land stolen by the state. Many of the names remain, Perquimans County, Chowan County, Pasquotank County, all Tuscaroran names, but the state took their land and never officially recognized the rights of the Tuscaroran people. It was in the swamps of eastern North Carolina that my people began to come together. A fusion culture emerged over the decades and some of those people had fair skin and blue eyes. Some were runaway slaves before they could get away to the north or to Canada. They found safe harbor in those swamps amongst the, first, the fusion culture of the so-called mulattoes. My history is complex. My ancestors were a mixed up people, some by choice, some by rape, who knew from their experience that colonialism wasn't the only way and white supremacy was a lie. My daddy made sure not only that I knew that history, but that it was included on my birth certificate, which says Negro with Indian <clears throat> and other descent. There are many people in this country who think the situation in Palestine is so far away that it has little to do with us. Um, I just came from hearings on Capitol Hill and in Richmond. Virginia, where we were standing with children who've been separated from their families by immigrant enforcement officers and water shutoffs and denial of access to health care and other basic services and voter su racist voter suppression. And, and it, might, some might, it might be tempting to think that we have enough domestic issues right here at home that it is someone else's task to address the rights of Palestinians halfway around the world. But I know from my own personal story in this country that we cannot talk about justice without addressing the displacement of native peoples wherever they are. We cannot talk about justice without addressing the systemic racism of colonialism. We cannot talk about justice without addressing government repression. We cannot talk about justice without addressing our own divisions, even within the movement. Our search, our search for truth and for justice cannot be found in narrow tribalism. In so many ways, the Palestinian experience resonates with my own experience. So I'm here today to talk about what's required if we are to be, from a deeply religious moral values perspective, human in the midst of the shared injustices we have all inherited from the lies of colonialism and white supremacy. My coming here today is deeply religious, which means it's deeply political, because for me, I do not separate my deep moral values from my faith. As a Christian minister who was raised in the often schizophrenic American church, I grew up knowing that the way some people talked about God's people and a divine right to any land didn't include me. I didn't grow up anywhere close to Israel or Palestine, but they weren't including me. The slave masters who saw my black ancestors as property also saw my native ancestors as savages and saw my white ancestors as traitors. And they didn't know what to do with my ancestors who were black but passed as white for survival. They said it was their manifest destiny. They believed to subdue the land that was promised to them no matter who was already there. To claim it, to control it, to confront anyone who challenged them with the threat of lethal force. It must be noted that the same colonialist mindset that enslaved black bodies and called it Christian also has been used by some to displace Palestinian families and call it pro-Israel. 
But based on the, even the ancient Hebrew scriptures, this cannot be true. Leviticus 19.34 says, You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you. You shall love him or them as yourself. Leviticus 24, 22, you shall have the same law and equality for the sojourner and the native. For I am the Lord your God who honors and loves all creation. Often when I was young, I heard fellow Christians talk about the nation state of Israel. I didn't ever hear much, especially from the TV preachers who talk so much about Israel, but I didn't hear much about the Palestinian people who were already living on that land when the largest numbers of European Jews fleeing terrible oppression in their own European countries settled in Palestine. Just as I didn't hear them talking about my people's story either, I didn't hear much about Palestinians, Palestinian rights, and the desperate moral need for equality in that land, like in any country for all people who live there whatever religion, whatever race. It was my father, God rest his soul, who was a friend to both Jewish people and Palestinian people, who taught me this history. It was my father who taught me that faith had to love and speak truth to every community represented in my fusion DNA. It was he who taught me about Palestine Palestinians and the Israelis. And so in my own faith journey, I learned that I can't be faithful to who I am if I don't speak up when the lies of power and systemic racism cause us to overlook someone else. Because the Bible I read says we are each made in the imago dei which is really the perspective I want to talk from today, not so much the political and all that, but what does it mean if you fundamentally believe that every person is created in the imago dei, the image of God, to write people off because of their nationality or their religion or race isn't simply an injustice against them. It is a violation of God's moral law. It also obscures my ability to see and know the fullness of the truth of the glory of God and the diversity of humanity that God created. And so I'm here today because everybody, I believe, is made in the image of God. And this is a truth that is acknowledged by Christians, Muslims, and Jews. And by the way, for all of my Jewish Muslim friends here, assalamu alaikum. I'm here because I know the deep importance of the work to bring together everyone who holds to that moral obligation that we recognize our Palestinian neighbors as fellow humans who deserve human rights. I'm here not naive, not unaware of the complexities, but to join the chorus of those honoring the imago dei of every living soul and created person. It's not always easy, but it must be done. It must be at the center of any goal to bring people together because the only other way is destructive and divided tribalism that eventually will destroy us all. This is why I must also say that I am here as one who has been called rabbi by those I work closely with in the Jewish community. I am a Christian minister who has preached Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. I'm a Christian minister who has prayed and spoken in the mosque. I'm a Christian minister who has invited Jewish and Christian persons not to an evening service but to morning service in my own church. And I want to say as clearly as I know how that the humanity and the dignity of any person or people cannot in any way diminish the humanity and dignity of another person or another people. To hold fast, to hold fast to the image of God in every person is to insist that the Palestinian child is as precious as the Jewish child, that all of God's children have rights 
And we must stand against hatred toward Jews and toward Palestinians, toward Israel and toward Palestine. And we must also acknowledge that we have pain and trauma in our past that makes it difficult for us to recognize God's image in one another. But we must. I come from First Nation people that face the pain of genocide and oppression, the people they practice on before the slaves. Oppression that has to this day never been addressed. I come from a people who were designated as chattel, constitutionally declared to be animals by people who were running, claimed they were running from persecution themselves, but still saw the need to enslave my people and fractionize them as a matter of the right of the United States. I come from a people who when they chose to pass as white, they were risking their life. And if they were caught passing, they could be hung on the spot when they were actually forced to pass because of the laws of the state. Oh, I know complexity. Complexity runs through my DNA. Israel has a complex history. Palestine has a complex history. The U.S. has a complex history, as so does every state. There is no one story of Israel as there is no one story of America. There's no one perspective on Zionism. For instance, historically, it is important for us to remember that one path regarding the Zionist project in Palestine was a colonialist project from the beginning, according to Theodore Herzl. Some say the founder of modern, or a form of modern Zionism. He knew that his proposal for a modern nation state for the Jewish people was a colonist, colonialist project. And he pitched it to Britain's great colonialist Cecil Rhodes as just that. It was never just purely about righting the terrible wrongs of the Holocaust from his perspective, but for him it was about expanding the global empire, and you can't ignore that if you know history. But on the other hand, Jews like Albert Einstein were always against this type of philosophy undergirding a Zionist project. Even though Einstein was clear, he was clear that the Jewish people had a right to safety, protect freedom from the horrors of genocide and the evil of the Holocaust, Einstein said, this, he said, he said this, led, this led Einstein to write, I am afraid of the inner damage Judaism will sustain especially from the development of a narrow nationalism within our own ranks. That is why there is nothing anti-Semitic about pointing out the dangers of extreme na nationalism. The Pope has done it. Others have done it. In fact, there have always been Jewish people as far back as the spiritual prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, they pointed it out all the way to a scientific genius like Einstein and others, eager on the one hand to hold on to the heart of their traditions who saw that making a deal with the empire wouldn't only hurt Palestinians, it would diminish them as well. I do not recall the colonialist past of the state of Israel to question, do not recall, question its existence. No, the nation of Israel exists just as the United States exists both with messy histories, which we must be honest about if we are to imagine a future where people can live in peace. Langston Hughes said even about America. America, America has never been American to me, and yet I swear this oath, uh, America will be. I didn't come to talk about that right, the right of state. I came to talk about what is a state's responsibility to all people. What is the state's, any state's responsibility to all people? Because people have rights. People have rights. And those rights supersede even the power sometimes and the vision and the goals of a state. This is why I was so moved by my dear friend Rabbi Susan Browse, who took her daughter to Hebron and Bethlehem to see firsthand what the occupation looks like and how settlers are drunk on an extreme narrow nationalism that keeps them from seeing their neighbor's humanity. This is what she wrote openly, a rabbi, and published in the LA Times when they came back. 
She said, Israel holds a multitude of truth. It is a Jewish state, yet moral leadership tends to come not from its official rabbit, uh, rabbit, rabbit official officers, but from its artists, its academics, and its activists. It is a proud, striving democracy that fails to uphold basic democratic norms for many, un many under its control. It is a young nation of exemplary ingenuity, imagination, and frankness that has failed to use that same creativity and honesty to seriously deal with the, what sovereignty means when one profoundly traumatized population holds great power over another. Then she said, my kid, my child is still grappling with what we saw and heard in Hepburn that day, but I don't regret taking her there because I trust her to grasp the complexities. I trust she understands that to love a place, Israel or the United States, does not necessarily mean to love its government. In fact, it sometimes means precisely the opposite. <laughs> End of quote. That's a rabbi and a daughter. Because I am committed to the image of God in every person, I must stand against any policy that institutionalizes the lies of division. When my own government imposes policies based on inhumanity, whether an economic system that keeps 140 million people in this country poor and low wealth, or dividing families and jailing children at the border, or passing voter suppression laws, or mass incarceration of poor people and people of color, and the, or the U.S. imposing a Muslim ban, or waging wars that kill hundreds and thousands of Iraqis, Afghanistans, Yemen, Syrians, Somalis, and so many others, we must stand up and say no with no exception if you believe in the image of God. And that is why when Israel violates international law and the human rights of Palestinians, we stand up and say no, no exception. If someone in the name of loving Palestinians embraces terrorism and killing of innocent people, children, we stand up and say no. I'm a Christian who honors one who chose the way of love and nonviolence, not as a fetish, nor as a tactic, but as a way of life, even in the face of terrorism and state crucifixion. In this country, we have a particular obligation to address the rights of Palestinian people because our tax money pays the 3.8 billion that the U.S. sends directly to the Israeli military every year. And the Bible teaches me where your money is, that's where your heart is. And our communities suffer from the extraordinary lack of access to funds for health care, education, jobs, and more, while there is never a lack of money to send billions to Israel. Our president, however much we, well, let me say, instead of saying however much we resist him, no matter how much he resists us, wants to build a wall based on the model of Israel's wall in Palestine. Our government protects Israeli military and political officials from ever being held accountable for their violations of international law, violations of human rights, even war crime, our, our, and props up the wrong embraced by Netanyahu and his cohorts. And some of our police departments go to training by Israel national police and military teaching our law enforcement officers the things they have learned in dealing with an occupied population, and we must challenge that. Why? Because the most damnable violence is always policy violence. Policy violence. The systemic use of power to privilege some and exclude others. We must confront the injustices against Palestinians because much of it is injustice carried out on our dime in our name. Like any systemic injustice, this policy violence all but guarantees that people who are pressed down and ignored generation after generation will at some point lash out in a last gasp for their own humanity, if not in self-defense. When Palestinian youth throw a rock, some say, see, we told you, and they call for a tax. But there can be no moral equivalency between policy violence of governments armed with missiles and the desperate children who fight back with stones. And yet, we must also be clear that we will always lose a fight against the empire if we try to use the empire's vision of weapons, for the empire specializes in death. As the brown-skinned Palestinian who is my rabbi, who is my Leader, Jesus said, if you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. 
we must lean into the deep power and wisdom of nonviolence. Not just a nonviolent day, but a life. Henry Highland Garnett was a fiery preacher. Even when black folk were enslaved, he said, even in slavery, you still have to choose which God you will serve, the God of the empire or the God eternal. Palestinians have a long history of nonviolence, from the general strikes of 1936 to the nonviolent mobilizations to the first intifada to the nonviolent protests against the wall still underway at villages across the occupied West Bank to this year's extraordinary Gaza protests in which tens of thousands of Gazans, young and old men and women, have stood unarmed only to be shot down by Israeli snipers. More than 165 killed, thousands more wounded with live gunfire, dozens now living with amputated arms and legs. And yet, like the slaves who fought slavery, like the devotees of civil rights, they still come. And any force who tries to lead the Palestinian people away from this to and for their own terroristic goals must be challenged and resisted too. Palestinians in recent years have used overwhelmingly nonviolent strategies of resistance. When they have not, when there have been attacks on civilians, we have and ha have to condemn that illegal use of violence, but there can be no moral equivalence between an Israeli tank or a high-tech drone or an armored caterpillar, D9 bulldozer, like the one used to kill Rachel Corey in Gaza 15 years ago, and the rock in the hands of a young Palestinian boy or girl. I take the words of Dr. Martin Luther King in his 1967 Riverside speech at the height of the Vietnam War when he said, I could never again raise my voice against the violence of the oppressed in the ghettos, he said, without having first spoken clearly to the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, in my own country. For the sake of those boys, for the sake of this government, for the sake of the hundred thousands trembling under our violence, Dr. King said, I cannot be silent. One other point here is the US, we cannot let so-called white evangelists like Jeffers and John Hagee and Falwell determine US policies toward Israel and Palestine or Franklin Graham. These persons embrace an often heretical form of theology. They suggest that if you are against abortion, against gay people, for prayer in the school, for school, for guns, for tax cuts, and for Israel, no matter what, then God is pleased. And it takes us or moves us closer to the end of the age in heaven. That is a lie. And on top of that, these groups say nothing about racial injustice right here in the U.S. or what is happening to the Palestinian people. And for those type mindset to be advising an administration, it is a form of theological malpractice and modern day heresy. In fact, if you follow the way of Trumpism and religious nationalism, we saw last night, yesterday, in the Kavanaugh hearing where you end up. You end up with sanctioned and, and consecrated gangsterization of our politics. First, we have a president selected, not elected, even though three million more people voted for the other candidate. And any time three million people vote for another candidate and the candidate that got three million less votes wins, that is not democracy. And then you have a party hijack the Supreme Court because the loser is rewarded the presidency by selection because of racist policies enacted years ago called the Electoral College that was designed to allow a minority to rule a majority. All of this is the result of the rules of the state, state actions, but they must be challenged even though the state says the Electoral College and all of that is legal. Because state rule doesn't make it right. I don't care if the state says it. Any state, racism is racism is racism. Fascism is fascism is fascism. Apartheid is apartheid is apartheid. And it doesn't matter if you try to legalize it. Those of us who believe in the image of God in all people must stand up against it.
And so, yes, in this moment, because of state rule, Palestinians now face a stark reality. No negotiations, no international diplomatic engagement, diplomatic engagement, no response from their nonviolent protests. It's a situation where it's not about how the Palestinians resist, but that they resist at all that leads the U.S. to give Israel a green light for continuing to escalate repression and the denial of right. There are no channels available to Palestinian protest or resistance. The Palestinian diplomatic chief was just expelled from the U.S. along with his wife and two little children, age five and seven, pulled out of their school because the Palestinians refused to negotiate on the brutally one-sided terms imposed by the Trump administration. In the face of such extreme injustices, it would be its own kind of violence not to speak out. We would be committing violence if we did not speak out. Instead, I choose to stand here today and remind you, even in these times, Mark, you're exactly right, Frederick Douglass, who spoke out after the terrible Dred Scott decision when the Supreme Court of this nation said that a black man has no right that a white man is bound to respect. And people came to Frederick Douglass and said, it's over, everything's over, there's no need of fighting anymore. It was a trying time in the abolition movement. Some said the freedom movement might never come. Some were saying we had to give up on the Constitution, give up on moral suasion, give up, give up. And at that low moment in the struggle, against the dehumanization of a race-based colonialist system, Douglas stood up and said, in one point of view, we the abolitionists and the colored people should meet this decision unlooked for and, and as monstrous as it appears, but we should meet it with a cheerful spirit. This very attempt to blot out forever the hopes of an enslaved people may be one necessary link in the chain of events preparatory to the downfall and complete overthrow of the whole slave system. The whole history of the anti-slavery movement is studied with proof that all measures devised and executed with a view to ally, ally and diminish the anti-slavery agitation have only served to increase, intensify, and embolden the agitation. In this moment, when Trump evangelicals have linked up with Zionist extremists and the corporate fascism of white nationalists around the world, it may seem like this campaign's goal of Palestinian rights is at a low point, but I stopped by today to say that in an unexpected way, our present troubles may increase, intensify, and embolden the agitation for Palestinian rights and for all human rights around the world. Indeed, this is what we're seeing as people who've been fighting in our silos. People are starting to link up across issues and recognize that you cannot address inter interlocking injustices without an intersectional fusion movement. We are starting to recognize how we are all connected, that the same corporate interests that use white nationalism to put Trump in the White House and lean to into Zion extremism, they're the same ones that also want to cut taxes for corporations and deregulate corporations and ignore climate science and take away health care and deny living wages and put up voter suppression and take away social safety nets and put, give more and more money to the U.S. military. If they are cynical enough to be together, we ought to be smart enough to come together and no longer fight in our silos. And the good news is, the good news is that if we come together, there are more of us than there are of them. And if we come together right, thank God Almighty, some of them have even joined us and will have to join us because our moral witness will convict them and convert them and show them that they've been traveling the wrong road of humanity. So my friends, it's time to come together. We must link up and together demand that Israeli government recognize the humanity of all people, regardless of religion, language, race, or anything else. 
Inside Israel, the new basic law stating that the right of self-determination belongs only to Jews must be reversed and replaced with a law that ensures that all rights are equally accessible to all. In the West Bank, Israeli military control over the Palestinian population should be ended and the population of Jewish-only settlement should be disarmed so that the entire population of the West Bank lives under one set of laws, not the current apartheid system of two sets of laws for two parts of the population population based on religion, race, and language. In Gaza, the siege that prohibits people from entering and leaving the Strip and that allows Israel to determine what does and does not enter the Strip should be ended so that Gazians can rebuild their territory and have the same rights as Israelis to come and go from their homeland. For Palestinian refugees, the long-standing denial of their internationally recognized right of return should be ended and a just solution to the refuge situation based on that right should be implemented. The United States must reverse its political and, 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 and moves on Jerusalem, its political moves, and its moves that only serve to foster more distrust, more hate. We must end the policy of preventing investigations and indeed providing uncritical protection of Israel's potential violations of human rights and of international humanitarian law. At the same time, Palestinians must continue relying on the principles of nonviolence that have long characterized the Palestinian freedom movement, such as the first infidelity or uprisings of 1987 and 1992. I have not been to Palestine. I hope to go. And I do not pretend to know fully what my Palestinian siblings have suffered, nor what my Jewish family must consider when they remember the Holocaust. But I do know trauma. I've known it personally. And my people have known it in this land since before there was a nation state called the USA. Yes, terrible things have been done. But I still believe that when we all get together, we can become something that has never been yet. In fact. That is the great hope of Jesus. The ultimate prayer of Jesus, the great Lord's prayer, is not our Father which art in heaven. It is, I pray that they might be one. The great prayer of the Jewish prophets that always reminded Israel in ancient Israel never to get high-minded and never to treat the people around them in a mean way. There was the prophets they said, that's not God's way. It was the prophets who said, like Isaiah 2, there must come a day when swords become plowshares, spears become pruning hooks, and a nation will not even train for war, let alone engage war, but will not train and come up with new systems of death and destruction. And it is the great hope of the psalmist, the psalm is honored by Jews, Muslims, and Christians, Psalms 118, 22, which says that the day that ultimately that God is looking for is when the stones that the builders rejected becomes the chief cornerstone. And when that day happens, this is the Lord's doing. Jewish people have known rejection. Palestinians have known rejection. Many of us have known rejection. But the only way forward, the only way out of a narrow and tribalistic way of thinking is to come together and to become the cornerstone of a new reality. You know, I know the power of coming together. I know it because in the Bible, when Moses and his people and his rod came together, Pharaoh came down. When Esther and Mordecai came together, they stopped the plots against the people. When David, his slingshot and his faith came together, Goliath that represented empire and power failed. Yeah, I know that when that brown-skinned Palestinian Jesus got folk together and when the people that followed him got together on Pentecost, Jews, Parthians, people from everywhere. Read the Bible, it's right there. They all got together. And when they did, they challenged the idolatry of Caesar the power of an empire. I know what coming together can do biblically, and I know what coming together has done down through the years. Justice really, y'all, has never lost. It's been beat up, it's been hurt, it's been challenged, 
But ultimately, justice is never lost because even when you just fight for justice, you won. But down, during slavery, it looked like justice had lost. But when Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and some white Quakers and some white evangelicals of that day, when they got together, they formed a fusion movement that brought about abolition. Women didn't have the right to vote. Sometimes we are told it was Sojourner Truth and a Quaker named Lucretia Mott and others. When they got together, they won the right to vote. Plessy versus Ferguson looked like it was the law of the land forever, separate but equal. One guy dissented, Justice Harlan out of Kentucky, and it was upon his dissent that Charles Hamilton Houston and then later Thurgood Marshall got white lawyers together and black lawyers together and Jewish lawyers, and they went before an all-white Supreme Court with one member who was a member of the KKK, but when they got together, even that member had to vote unanimously that separate but equal was unconstitutional. It looked like Jim Crow had been, had been, had, had, had beaten us down, down, and had beaten down injustice, couldn't rise again, but when Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King and Malcolm and Bayard Rustin and Glenn Smiley and Jonathan Daniels and Viola Wusa, a white woman, and Rabbi Heschel and James Reed and others, when they all began to work against it, Jim Crow had to come down. So I know it biblically. I know it historically. I know, I know it, and we have to know it so that we don't give up fighting. We have to know the power of our coming together. We have to know that it's just our time. Others had to stay together before us, and it's just our time. That's why you're alive now, to join with somebody, to bring somebody together. Whether we're, whether we're Jewish or Christian or Muslim or Sikh or Hindu, or whether we're not believers at all, we have to at some point come together, whether from a humanist perspective or a faith perspective, to believe that there is certain value in everybody, that there's a certain creation nature, a certain imago dehi, a certain innateness, an inalienableness, a right that belongs not to states but to people. And when we come together, we can change the world. I know it personally too because some years ago, Mark, they said I'd never walk again. They said I'd never get out of a wheelchair. My body was fighting itself. My muscles were fighting my bones. My nerves were fighting my brain. I was 30 years old, had always depended on my legs. One morning I woke up and couldn't move. I spent three months in a bed at UNC Hospital not knowing if I'd ever get up again. For 12 years I was in a wheelchair. I went into depression. I was oppressed by the, by the state of things in my life. And, and it kept telling me, you'll never walk again. You'll never walk again. But somehow over those 12 years, my doctor got to Together. my swim coach got together, my mind got together, my faith got together, my masseuse got together, the coaches got together, the therapists got together, the prayer warriors got together, my family got together. You saw me walk in here tonight because I'm here to tell you, when we all get together, we can walk again, we can march again, we can change things again, and that's what it's going to take in order for the Palestinians to have their rights, in order for all people, Jewish and Palestinian, Christian and Muslim, to exist together. I'm a witness that when we all get together and honor the Imago Dei here and everybody, that's when we can remake the world. James Baldwin said it. We made this world we live in. We can make it again, but we can't remake it again by ourselves. It's time for us to come together. And when we all come together, what a day of justice it will be for Palestinians, for Jewish, for all of us when we all come together. Hallelujah.